review. Okay, so principle one, what is it called? AO1, audience of one, was the question we asked in that. Paul, what? Who what, what do you worship? Thank you, Rodney. Who or what do you worship? Okay, two. Some of the size the interns answer. answer. Inside game, my favorite one. Y'all better know this one. Inside game, what's the question we ask in it? What motivates you? Okay, and then this morning, Brandon led us through the third one, which is? Yes, and then we asked the question, what? How do I grow? Exactly. So how do we how do we get to grow like we do it on our field or our, our the, the field or the court? How do we do it in our faith as well? So we're doing principle number four, which is called hurting for certain. So I want you guys to watch this video first. The way I see it in life, you got to find a way to survive. These desert rooms are the test in every way. Heat, isolation, the unpredictability of the terrain make it one of the toughest runs in America. We gotta find a way to move forward, to grow as a runner, as a human being. So, uh, so because I'm at Arizona State, I live in Arizona, so that is pretty real. Now we're like in Phoenix or T Phoenix Tempe, so it's city, but there are some places really close to where we live where you can go out, you can go, and it looks a lot like that. You can hike that. I don't really like to hike, so y'all can get down, but I don't really do that. Um, I'm also afraid of heights. But when I watch that, um, I think of what, what I see there in the desert and, and what he's saying in the video. So he says, you've got to find a way to survive. All right, he's talking about there's heat, 110 degrees, I think it said, um, unpredictability of the terrain. And then he says, you've got to find a way to move forward and to grow as a runner and as a human being. And there's a reality that there are, there are going to be seasons of our life that are like that run. So sometimes we're isolated, right? We are in the heat of life that gets turned up, and this stuff is unpredictable. And so like this commercial, though, we've got to find a way to survive. But not just survive, we've got to find a way. How do I lean in and press forward in these desert seasons of suffering? How do I even do that? And so the question we're asking in principle four is how do I deal with suffering? So that is what we're going to be talking about. How do I deal with suffering in my own life and in the lives of others around me? Um, how does God encourage us to even deal and handle and enter into this crap and do this? How are we supposed to do this, God? So um, God gives us the life of a man in the Bible that y'all just read about named Joseph. Well, hopefully you just read through it. So let's just do a quick overview of Joseph's life. So there's this dude named Jacob and he had 12 sons. And his favorite dude was a dude named Joseph. That was his favorite son. It's kind of like he, he played favorites. I don't have kids, so I don't know if that's actually... Do y'all the parents have favorites? I don't really know. We, we can ask them later. But he really... Jo Joseph's dad really had favorites. And it was like really obvious. So he gave his favorite Joseph this coat. And then Joseph has this these dreams, right? And he has these dreams of ruling over his brothers. And then your boy goes and tells his brother about those dreams. Which is dumb as I don't know what. Like if you have a dream that you're going to rule over your siblings, I don't know if you're going to go be like, yo, I'm about to rule over you one day. You're going to be like, what? You're done, right? So I'm like, he's not very smart in the first place. But but here, so he goes and he tells his brothers that his brothers get super jealous. So they're like, forget him. We're throwing him in a pit. So they take his coat. They, they throw him in a pit. 
And then as they're waiting for it, they're like, what are we going to do? Can we can't just leave him in this pit? Um, a bunch of slave owners come by, and he's like, all right, well, well so I'm just like, so he gets sold into slavery by his brothers. He ends up being the property of a new name, Potiphar. Is this all sounding familiar? Everybody probably just read this. Um, and then so in Potiphar's house, he works his way up to becoming a servant in Potiphar's home. And then Potiphar is a ratchet wife. Comes at him, right? You guys just read it. You know this is true because he just read the story. Potiphar's ratchet wife is like, ooh, Joseph. Hey, okay, okay, hey, Joseph. Um, but Joseph, right, so Joseph, he could give in, but he doesn't. And he runs away from Potiphar's wife. And nevertheless, her ratchet self still goes and blames and says she he raped her. And then for doing the right thing, he's, your boy still ends up getting thrown in prison, right? So then in prison, um, it's looking real bad. But then Pharaoh has some dreams, and he's like, who can interpret my dreams? And Joseph knows that he can interpret Pharaoh's dreams because God's given the ability to do that. So he interprets Pharaoh's dreams for him. And then uh, Pharaoh basically elevates him. He gets like promoted in Pharaoh's company to like number two dude in charge. And then your boy is over all of the grain. And if you're over all the grain, which equals food in a famine, you're kind of a big deal. Like everybody's trying to like be up on your coattails because you are over all the food. So his brothers come. You guys know this. He, they come and they, they don't even recognize Joseph. And he's like, oh, brothers, it's me, Joseph. And then he thinks they're going to, they should kill him. And he doesn't. He ends up taking him into the house, providing food for him and whatnot. So that's a, the short version of the story that y'all just read. And so with that story of Joseph's life as our backdrop, we're going to look at three things from principle four today. We're going to look at reality, response, and redemption. We're going to look at the reality of suffering. We're going to look at our response to it. And then we're going to look at God's redemption of our suffering. Um, this, this principle feels like there is so much. So we're just going to like go through it. So follow it along in your notes. I would like, I'll throw out a lot of scripture references. I would write them down so when y'all are going back through your notes, you can go look up where these verses are and you can read them as you're going through. So, okay. Here's the first. Reality. Let's look at reality. Life outside of the garden is broken and inevitably involves suffering. Okay, so life outside the garden is broken and it involves suffering. Um, we've mentioned suffering a lot. We're going to talk, this whole principle is about suffering. So what, what is it? So suffering, simply put, suffering is the pain that you experience as a result of a trial. You want to answer? We can call, I can call it. No, um, but so ex the pain you experience as a result of a trial. And then pain is obviously something that you feel that hurts. And then a trial is something circumstantially difficult that happens to you. So when something hurts you, whether it's emotionally, physically, or psychologically, the resulting pain from that causes suffering. And that's what we're talking about today. And so one thing before we start that we need to understand is that suffering, um, whether it comes to you through a major or a minor incident, uh, suffering is suffering. So we cannot minimize other people's pain, right? We cannot. So you, some of you that were like, we're, we are going through a multitude of different suffering in here. You can't be like, uh, you getting hurt in your sport, your little injury means nothing compared to my parent dying. Right? We can't do that. We, suffering comes at us from multiple different directions. God allows it from multiple different places. And we are all changed by it. So we cannot minimize each other's pain today. Um, we cannot compare. Like, I wouldn't even compare yourself to Joseph's story. Like, man, Joseph really went through... A lot more than me, I, mine doesn't matter, because it does. Pain is pain, and suffering is suffering. Okay, so here's what we know. Follow along, this is in your notes. Suffering is tied to life outside the garden. What do we mean by that? What garden are you even talking about, Emma? I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. So when I talked about on Sunday night, creation, and that all that created, that God created for Adam and Eve to, to rule over, like the, the place that's untouched, and unmarred by sin, that's the garden we're talking about. So suffering is a direct result of the fall. So before the moment of the fall, suffering was not even a thing. It didn't exist. Pain and suffering are a direct result 
of a broken relationship with God. And so God didn't make us. He didn't make the world that creation. He didn't make us to experience suffering. He didn't make us for it. So who is the architect of this wax stuff called suffering? Who is the architect of it? The architect is your boy Satan. So Satan is the author, the broke, <clears throat> the author of brokenness and suffering. Satan is God's enemy, and he stands against all that is good and all that is blessing to God's people. He is against it. Um, the Bible tells us more about his role, but we need to know about our enemy. And so we're going to talk a little bit about him. So here's one thing about him. He has limited power, but his influence is great. His limited power, but his influence in the world is still great. So let me clear this up. When Christ went to the cross and he defeated death and he rose again and he died and rose again, Satan was done. He was taken out. It was curtains for Satan. Right? Satan's defeat, his destruction, his demise is secure in the resurrection of Christ. Satan is done. But for the time being, right now, right, there is still, Satan still has a period of time where he'll be able to have influence in the world. So theologians will often, you'll hear this called the already, but the not yet. So it's like this space that we live in where believers are actively participating in the kingdom of God, right? We, we have victory over sin right now. It's right now, but... God's kingdom is not going to reach its full expression, right? It's not going to be restored to all as God meant it to be a creation for a time being. So in the meanwhile, we're chilling in this already but not yet. Satan still has some influence, but we are still called to be kingdom bringers or people who give a preview of God's kingdom and what it will be like even in the midst of Satan's influence, even in the midst of Satan's Black schemes that he tries to come after us with, we are called to be faithful in the midst of it. Here's the other thing about Satan, is that his mission is to steal and to kill you and to destroy you. Right, so John 10.10, 10, this is what it says, the thief comes, the thief is Satan, only to kill and steal and destroy. And then 1 Peter 5.8 says this, that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is no joke, and he sets himself against you and all that God has for you. Our enemy is very real, and he is the author of this stuff we call suffering. However, however, he should not be used as an excuse for your own poor choices. Okay, so let me give you an example of that, which I may or may not have seen this a lot in college. If you decide, because you know there's something that wasn't illegal, wasn't legal in California, but now it is, and if you decide that you want to go buy and smoke a little bit of greenery, a little bit of shrubbery, and then you get a phone call that you have a random drug testing in the morning, and then you show up because you have no choice. We all know we're in the NCAA, so y'all all know how this goes. I got like four, four times this happening in college. Not the week part. <laughs> the phone call part. <laughs> the phone call part, y'all. I got the phone call like, oh, I gotta go in at 6 a.m. to go pee in the cup in front of this random person while she watches me. So it's really cute and whatever. But um, um, so if you get that call and you go and you get a positive drug test, and so you're ineligible. You cannot look at me and say, man, the devil, he's really trying to hold me down because he don't want me to be great. <laughs> he don't want me to be great. And I just am going to say to you, look, boo-boo, he did not buy and smoke the shrubbery. You did, right? So we cannot, we cannot blame our enemy for some of our own poor choices that we make, right? Because sometimes we do that. Sometimes we do. Um, but here's the deal. So Satan's the originator of this suffering thing. And here's, we need to understand some other things. So suffering, this is also in your notes, suffering, it is complex. It's complex, and it comes at us from many different directions. So sometimes suffering in our lives, it comes as a result of our own choices, of things that, that we have, have, have chosen. For Joseph, right, he couldn't control what his brothers did, 
But his punk self did decide to act a little crazy and tell them, I'm going to rule over you, right? So not that he, they could, his brother should have chosen that, but he chose to say that in that matter. Um, and we do this all the time. Like, what are things that are completely 100% in our control that because of our choosing, this has happened, right? Um, but then sometimes suffering enters in our lives because of other choices. So they come as a result of other people's decisions. So things like your coach's behavior or maybe your parents' choice to get a divorce that's causing a lot of suffering or a friend's choice to betray you, right? And so jo Joseph's brothers made a choice to throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery and he had no control over what they did. He could have controlled the decision-making process for them. And then thirdly, different circumstances are also what can contribute to your suffering. So when suffering occurs because of circumstances that aren't directly related to any decision made by anyone, this would be things like an injury or sickness or an accident. And we see these things happen like uh, in the story of Joseph. What are the chances that a group of slave traders would just stroll by while they're trying to figure out what to do with their brother? Right? Or who would have known that at the end of the story, there would be a famine that causes them to be back together in each other's presence. Right? These are things outside circumstances that no one could have controlled or foresaw. So Satan is the author. right? He's the author. And suffering is very complex. And it comes at us from different directions. But ultimately, here's the challenge. The challenge is to not simply avoid or manage your suffering, but to lean into God when we encounter it. And that could sound kind of cliche where you're going through some hard stuff and people are like, oh man, you gotta trust the Lord, right? So I don't want it to sound like a, fl a flippant phrase where people just say it because the reality is, is it's not always that easy, but it is true. It's not always that easy, but it is true. And so the title of this principle is called Hurting for Serving because no matter where suffering comes from, it's guaranteed that you will suffer. So here's what John 16, 33 says. Y'all can read, again, y'all can read all these verses later, but Jesus is talking, and he says, in this life, you will have trouble. He does not say, in this life, if you may be kind of, sort of, you could have some trouble. He says, in this life, you will have trouble. But this is what he says after that. He says, take heart. For I have overcome the world. So he's like, surely, take heart, because I've overcome the world, so surely I will be with you through this. I will never leave you. So we know that suffering is a guarantee for us as Christians. So then the question still remains, how do I respond in suffering when it comes, when, I, when it hits me? And there's really two responses to it. Yes, there are nuanced, there's things within each of them, but there really is two main responses and one of them is you can either move toward God by faith or you can move away you can move away from him in any number of ways to cope so if I'm going to choose God to choose to move towards God by faith if I'm going to choose that then there are some things that I, I need to know about God because when it when the crap is the fan I need to know who God is so here's our response we're going into response Trusting God's sovereignty is the best response to suffering. What do, we, what do we mean when we say sovereignty? So simply put, it's up on the screen. Sovereignty means to reign or rule over all. To reign or rule over all. So in this case, in the case of suffering, it means that God is in control of everything that happens in your life. Everything that happens God is in control of. Nothing happens to you or me that God has not first allowed it to happen first. So everything that happens to me passes through the hands of God before I get it. Which might make you feel kind of sketchy because you're like, for real, God, you let that pass through your hands? Because that's kind of how I feel sometimes. <laughs> oh, that's kind of how I feel. But we, will, but we will get to that. We will get there, right? We're kind of like, God, for real, if you let that pass through. But here's the deal. So because God is sovereign over all things, there are some things we need to know when we're facing suffering. So we got to know that God's love and God's power anchor his followers in the face of suffering. 
it, it anchors his, his followers in the face of suffering. So um, one of my teammates at UCLA, she was like 6'4", she's from the Florida Keys. Has anybody been to the Florida Keys? Hey, Florida, Florida people. But um, so I went home with her for a spring break one time in college, and it was really fun. We can talk about that later. But um, in the Florida Keys, uh, one thing that I noticed was we would drive and people's boats would not be tied to a dock, but they would be like out in the middle of the water and they would they, they would have their anchor dropped. But I, I was kind of like, what? Um, so when you want to use your boat, how are you going to get it? Yeah. Like I was like, you going to swim to it and climb up the ladder? Like, so I still don't know that process. I still don't know how people get their boats when they do that. Maybe some people who have boats could share with me at the top. But, um, but what I learned, <laughs> what I learned is that people in Florida, they don't tie, they often don't tie their boats to the dock because they have hurricanes. So they'll anchor their boats out in the middle of the water into the deep water. They'll drop their anchor so that when the hurricane comes and the storms come, if they had it tied to the dock, the boat would be crashing up against the dock and they'd come out after the hurricane to have nothing left but splinters. Right? So uh, they so they do that so that when the storm and the hurricane comes and it blows, yeah, the boat's gonna get a little wet, right? It's gonna be a little rocky but the boat's gonna be fine because it's anchored deep into the water and not tied to the dock. And I was thinking, we, in suffering, we need the same thing. If we are not anchored into the deep love of God, into the power of God, the hurricanes and storms of life are gonna come and they're gonna shake us and we're gonna knock against the dock and knock against the world and then we're gonna be left in shambles, in splinters left of our lives. But if we are anchored deeply in the heart of God and in the power and strength of God, when the storms of life come and they shake us, we are going to get a little wet. It is going to be a little hard. But at the end of the day, we're not crushed. We're not broken. Because our hope is in the Lord. Because we are anchored in the love of God for us and the fact that He is sovereign. Does that make sense? Okay, so secondly, God's promises bring about good in every circumstance for those who love him. So Romans 8, 28, it's a pretty popular verse. A lot of people like to recite it. But here's what it says. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So in all things, right, all means all. No matter what happens, God will take what's going on and he will work it out for your good and his glory. If you are called according to his purpose, right? So a little caveat, if you are not a Christian, if you are not a child of God yet, this is one of those things that Jamie talked about that are one of, one of the benefits of being a child of God, that God will work all things out for your good and his glory. But this kind of doesn't apply if you're not a child of God, right? So just a short little reminder. But so he, um, he is... The reason we need to remember Romans 8, 28, like the reason people quote it so much, right, is because that's a promise from God. So like we need to remember it because if we don't remember that God is going to work out all things for the good, we're going to lose it when, when life comes. And not only is he going to work it out for good, but God is good, right? God's plan is good. God's character attribute is good. Like the summation of all of who he is is goodness, y'all. And if I don't remember that God is good, that goodness is, is all the summation of who he is, why in God's green earth would I ever trust somebody that I don't, why would I ever listen or follow some, someone that I don't trust? I wouldn't. Y'all will not. If you don't believe that God's good, you're not going to follow him. We've got to be able to know that he's good if we're going to follow him, if we're going to trust him. So then the other one, the next one after that in your notes, God doesn't always allow us to understand why we suffer, or how it will work out. So I told you guys on Sunday night that when I fell down the stairs and whatever and had to get my surgery, that was um, a trial or an injury that I very much like knew what God was doing. Uh, in the midst of, of getting through that injury, God taught me so much about dependency, letting other people help you, dependency on him, surrender. I had prayed for surrender, y'all, and then I broke my knee. I was like, okay, this is not what I had in mind. But I knew, I knew, 
I had literally papers written that happened, but I knew, because I, so I knew, like, I was like, God, I know what you're doing in my life in this trial. Like, I see it. I'm experiencing it. But that's not always the case. And more often than not, things are going to happen, and we are not going to get to understand why they happened. So I think about, um, about three years ago, one of my roommates, we were at our house. I left. Um, I was about 10 minutes down the road. And she shot me a text and said, hey, I just got a phone call that my dad died last night. So I bust a U-turn in the middle of the street, and I race back to my house. Um, and I hug her, and she's sobbing. I start crying because I'm like, one of, one of the things that was hard is we have been, we have been praying for months and months about her dad coming to Christ. We have been praying that she would be a part of, of his salvation story, that he would surrender his life to the Lord. And that hadn't happened yet. But he passed away in the middle of the night in his sleep. So we're packing her a bag of clothes. I'm packing a bunch of food in a bag. And then I go to drop her off to the airport. And in the car, she says, Am I just can't fathom the fact that I might not see my dad again, ever. Because that, as far as we knew, we didn't know if there was a decision ever made. And she, her name's Kristen. She'll never get to know why that happened. Why God wouldn't pursue his heart and allow him to repent and turn, come to faith before he passed away. She'll have to spend her life hoping that at some point, at a moment that we, don't, we know nothing about, he did surrender his life. We just don't get to know. Joseph, right, in the story y'all read, God gave Joseph a vision of what his life with his future leadership <coughs> would look like. But for the next 13 years, Joseph went through some BS, right? Joseph, at that time, he's probably thinking, like, God, you've forgotten about me. You have abandoned me. Like, what is this? And some of you probably are sitting here like, God, you, you have forgotten me. You have abandoned me, right? But God's timing, it is perfect. So God knows what he's doing, even when we don't. And that is also in your notes. And write down this verse, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. This is what it says. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways his thoughts are not our thoughts because y'all it is good to remember that God is God and we are not we are not and so just because something doesn't make sense to us just because we think it should be happening differently right it doesn't mean that God should listen to us and he probably shouldn't because really in my own brain I'm like really a hot mess so, thankfully, he doesn't always listen to us. Um, B of your notes, how we respond to suffering reveals our trust in God's promises. And I already mentioned it a little bit, God's promises, but do y'all have those players? I did, at least. These, those players who were like, their fundamentals were real tight. So, in practice, they looked so good. And in the warm-ups, you're like, oh, they look so good, right? But on the field or the court, they couldn't, like, transfer over, like, what they had, they could do in practice and in warm-ups. They couldn't transfer it over to execute it on the court. Do y'all have people like that in your sport? That happened in basketball all the time. But we are just like that. In the heat of life, right? Like, we, we were like, we're good. I'm following Jesus solidly. Yes, like, I got this. I'm going to follow. Like, right, we think we're doing good. And then, and then our life, like, has a downward spiral. And then we're like, oh, dang, like, I kind of suck in the game time. Right? Like, it's, it's so hard. We're like that in real life where sometimes what we know doesn't transfer over and how we're feeling in life when this stuff happens to us. Someone once told me, don't forget in the darkness what you knew in the light. So, <laughs> why y'all laughing? <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> don't forget in the darkness. But what, is it, what does it say, right? Like, there's some truth that you know. Like, you know that you know that you know. 
But when it gets dark, you're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but you know. So when those times come, like, don't forget what you knew in the light. Don't forget what you knew in the light. So when we go through suffering, we always have some choices to make. We always do. So one of the choices we have to make is uh, to choose to get bitter or to choose to get better. So Joseph, right, he continued to submit himself and to do what was right, even though, like, he kind of had every reason to turn his back on God because he's like, what? What is going on, right? So what this often looks like in my own life, I'm just going to be real with y'all, be transparent. Sometimes I love being single, okay? I'm like, yes, like I get to do stuff and go places and invest my time in ways that all the married parents in here would tell you they can't, right? Like, so I sometimes I'm like, I love this, love this life. And then I have the moments where I'm like, I hate this life, right? Where I'm like, I like, I, I want to be a mom, right? Like, right, we, like, I'm like, I hate this. So in those moments, I get really bitter. And when I get really bitter, my thought process is, I'm just gonna thought trot my way to the club and find me a ratchet, I'm gonna marry him. Okay, like, that, like that's just my thought process. When I get bitter, when I get bitter, <laughs> what are y'all laughing at, thought trot? <laughs> y'all ever heard that? Y'all know about the thought trot? Don't try to run, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Y'all crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> but when I get bitter, okay, real talk, this is this is my thoughts. It's like I'm a thought, try to do the club, I'm fine rat, I'm just marry whoever, right? So but to choose to choose to be better instead of bitter, right? What's that look like for me? It's like, God, how do you want me to experience intimacy with you while I'm single? Like, what does this look like for me to be so faithful to the call you have in my life by my dang self? And you, you know, me and God. But to be faithful as a single person. Like, even when you feel like your dreams are unfulfilled up in here, like you're like, Lord, do you even hear me? Who are answering the prayers that I'm praying for? Right? Like, even when that's happening, like, what does it look like for you to be faithful in your singleness as a male and a female? Like, God, how do you want to use me, right? That's what happens when you get better and not bitter. Because, but none of y'all better go home and thought try. No. Okay. Good. <laughs> just having that clear. Just want to make it clear. No thought try. Um, we're going to make a hashtag, no thought try. <laughs> for UTC SoCal, everyone's just like, what were you guys doing over there? Okay. Um, okay, so here's the other decision we have to make. We either have to, we, either, we have a decision to get revenge or to release. Revenge or release. So when you suffer and you feel pain, especially when it's at the hands of other people, y'all, it, so, it is so easy to want someone to feel what you're feeling, so like to lash out and get revenge. That, that's natural. But here's the thing. In Christ, you can do what's unthinkable in the world's eyes. And you can release that person from their debt to you. That is unthinkable to most of the world. You can forgive them and you can release them from their debt to you. You can ask God to give you strength to do it because ain't none of y'all doing that without the power of the Holy Spirit in you. It is too hard to forgive and release the debt of someone that has hurt you so deeply without the power of God in you. But we, still, we saw it in Joseph's life, right? Joseph, 13 years, his brother's sold him into slavery and then he went through crap through that whole thing and then they come at the end needy for food and Joseph could have had him killed and he was like I love you guys he brought him into his palace with them basically and then Jesus right who on the road to the cross getting beaten spit on yelled at ridiculed Jesus never clapped back Jesus never clapped back Right? Jesus took that on and he called, he could have called down an army of angels to defend him. And he didn't. Right? It is unthinkable to release and not take revenge. But what does uh, Romans 12.19 say? Romans 12.19, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I will repay, says the Lord. 
So then lastly, two of the choices we get to make is I can either choose to medicate or I can choose to meditate. So when the discomfort of suffering comes, right, medicating the pain is the easiest thing in the world to do because we just, we just feel so hurt. We just want the pain to go away. We're like, just take it away, Lord. So we do a bunch of things to try and feel better. And so the list of ways that we try to medicate, I mean, it goes, it goes on and on from sex to alcohol to shopping or spending uh, to eating or some of y'all are guilty of this, being with people incessantly, I was guilty of that. Um, or even retreating and being withdrawing and being alone, right? So when I was uh, a freshman in high school, it was a long time ago, I started dating a dude, and I ended up dating that dude from my freshman year of high school to my sophomore in college. So I dated this guy for six years. And so uh, it was off and on, you know how it goes. He's playing football in Utah, I'm playing basketball at UCLA. Um, but he was my first love, um, my first, like, like I, I was like, I'm marrying this guy. Like, we were like, we're going to get married. Um, so our soft, my sophomore year, when that relationship was, like, really for real done, because we'd broken up, like, you know, 13 times <laughs> over the course of two years. So don't judge me. But when that was finally, like, really done, like, it wasn't going to be no more breakup, but actually, like, it was done. Like, we're, like, we really called it quits on the relationship for real. I was... I was devastated and I was so sad. I was so broken because I was like, no, we, we always break up and get back together. Like, what's the deal? You know, but it was done. And so in those moments, I remember I really wanted to medicate with my four favorite men, Jack Daniels, Jim Bean, Jose Cuervo, and Captain Morgan. Right? I really, I really wanted to medicate with my four favorite men. Okay, but so I remember um, I would cry myself to sleep for months and months and months after that breakup happened. And I was so broken. Like, I remember in my dorm room, much like the dorm rooms we're sleeping in now, it was like all the bad memories. What? I would wake up. I would wake up in the middle of the night. And I would be in my whack, small dorm bed. And I would be so sad. I would be so filled with emptiness. I would be, have my head in my pillow soaking it wet with my tears. Because I had a roommate, right? She would have been like, shut up, if I was too loud. So I was like muffling my cries in my pillow, just stop, just like wetting my pillow with my tears because I was so broken. And so I remember this was like the first remnant of me beginning to learn what it was like to pursue Jesus. Because I was so empty that I was like, okay, I have to fill it. I have to fill it. So I would start to grab my Bible off of my desk right next to my bed. And I would just open that mug and start reading it. And half the time I had no clue what I was reading, but I had to meditate on God's word because I was like, I have to fill this empty void with something. So as I began to meditate on God's word and fill the void with the, with the words of the, of the Bible, that started to transform me. Like I, start, I didn't even realize it, and I started to be transformed by the word of God in one of the worst seasons of suffering I lived in at that point in my life, right? So that's what we have the choice to do. Are you going to medicate with my four favorite do? Don't do it. Or are you going to meditate on the word of God and be transformed by the living, active, powerful word of God, right? Because here's the thing. You don't, you won't just wake up and trust God this way one day. You won't. You can't just come to this 45-minute talk and then all of a sudden be like, okay, I'm changed, let's go. Right? Choosing this step, like trusting God this way is a choice to do it moment after moment after moment after moment. So trusting God in the midst of suffering, it is a continual process. And it begins today and it will go for the rest of your lives. And every single one of us is in a different place when it comes to this relationship that we have with suffering. So, this is a picture of my parents. Oh, this is going to make me cry. Gosh, dang it. I'm sorry. I hate crying for you guys. <laughs> so, this is my parents. We are Bruins. Don't get it twisted. The only reason they have this color on is because my little brother played at football at Iowa State. So, don't get it twisted. I do not like Cardinal and Gold. Okay. Just had to put that out there and let y'all know. Okay, so... Um, a year and a half ago, 
Um, I was in Ohio at our headquarters. I was speaking at a conference there, and uh, I was it was Friday night, and I was about to leave to go head over to the room um, because we were about to start. And I got a phone call from my sister, and my sister was so like um, she was crying so hard. I was like, "Yo, uh, I can understand you. Like, I really need you to talk where I can hear you." So. She said, a mom has cancer, and it's really bad cancer. And I was like, what? Ain't nobody call me. So I pick up my phone, and I call my mom and dad, and they were like, man, we told her not to tell you until you got home from the conference you're at. And um, my mom, she was like, yeah, I have cancer. And my mom is an RN. She's been a nurse for 35 years. So my mom's like a super-duper realist. Like, she called the kettle black, and she's holding back no truth, right? So my mom was like, I have cancer, and like, it's going to be really bad. I'm just warning you. And I'm like, okay. So we find out it's a, my mom, she had been having pain in her quad, and so she was in physical therapy because she was like, oh, I pulled my quad. Uh, and nothing was changing. The pain was still there, still getting worse. So uh, they ordered an MRI, like, well, let's just check out what's going on in your muscle. So they took an MRI of her quad, and there was lesions of cancer all over her pelvis and her femur. So my mom, because she knows she's been an oncology nurse half of her life, she's like, oh, this is bad, because I know that this has spread here from somewhere else. So they scan her, a full body scan, because they have to find out where the source is coming from. And so she has renal cancer, so it's on her kidney, and it's metastasized all over her body. Um, so she is, it, we found it at stage four, and, um, She'll, she'll never be cured from it. This, the, you know, the diagnosis or whatever, like, uh, she'll never be cured from it. And she constantly reminds us, um, like, people with stage four won't live that long, like when we talk about the future. She's like, oh, people with stage four won't live that long. Um, so we just live, probably some of you are in this room and you're in this too. If you are, I'm with you. But we just live in this perpetual state of, you get a scan every three months, and you just you get anxiety when that happens, and you wait to see like is the scan going to give you good news or bad news, and you just pray that as the cancer is spreading, because that's it is you're trying to like kill it, but you're, it's also spreading because it's a very aggressive cancer. You just pray that it doesn't hit any vital organs because that's when it actually will kill you. And so. I am still learning to engage with God in this process of suffering. I'm way older than y'all. I'm like, you guys are like 18, 21 or two or whatever. I am a lot older than you guys and I'm still learning to engage this process of suffering. I still don't do it well sometimes. I still yell at God in my prayers and say like, how is this? You let it come. What? Like, I look around and I see other people's life, and I'm like, you let this, the, you've given them everything they want, and then you let this come through for the Tautolos? Like, what did we ever do, right? Like, you start to be crazy. Like, you start to yell these things at God, because you're like, how could you, how is this my life? Like, you, you take your biggest what ifs to God. You're like, what if, like, my mom, like, never gets to, like, be at my wedding. What if, like, if I ever have kids, my mom doesn't get to like know her grandkids. Like you start to go, oh, you start to go down the worst what ifs, right? But you, I still have to learn to engage with God, like the depths of my suffering. I still have to do it. And I still have to like look up and say, God, you're good. You know, I'm saying all of this right now by faith because I don't feel none of it, right? God, you're, you're still good because your word says that you are. Because it's true, even though I don't actually believe it right now, it is, right? And you still, the discipline of God, you're good. Help me to press into you in the midst of, of my worst, my least favorite season of all of life. Okay, I'm done talking about that. I can't. I cannot. Okay, but finally, let's move on. The last part of principle four is redemption, guys. And redemption. Praise the Lord for redemption. But here's a redemption. God will redeem our suffering for our good and his glory. And that word redeem, it means to take something broken and through payment, make it whole again. 
So it's this theological concept to understand that Jesus' death on the cross functioned as payment. His blood, right, was what was paid for what was broken. And to buy us back because we were separated from God. And so we've been bought back by the blood of Christ. Because, like I said, I said it earlier, but at creation, God did not make us for death. He didn't, death wasn't a thing. At creation, he didn't make us for suffering. That has all come as a result of sin. He didn't make us for those things. And so he wants to restore all creation back to the way he meant it to be at the very beginning. So though he redeemed our lives on the cross, right, death, like, it didn't automatically wipe out death and suffering. We still have that, right? He promises one day in the future he's going to do it. He's coming back. He's wiping everybody's tears, like, there will be no more suffering. Death will not be a thing. But until then, suffering is a part of our experience as humans. But even now, so God's still redeeming and he's buying back. He's redeeming and buying back the temporary suffering, right? Because we know it's temporary. We know it's temporary. This will not last forever when you're in Christ. How is this happening? This is in your notes. Suffering, it's a refining process that can produce growth in our lives. Y'all, there is no wasted pain. Your tears, your tears are not wasted. There is a point and there is purpose to it. Write this verse down, Psalm 56, 8. This is, a, I read this verse a lot, if you can't tell. But it says, you keep track of all of my sorrow. You have collected my tears in a bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Right? There is, your pain is not wasted. Your tears are collected in the bottle like that. Your pain is not wasted. God is going to use suffering to change you, whether you think it or realize it or not. The other thing suffering will do is it will reveal character. It will reveal, it will reveal, reveal character. Nothing brings out the real in us more than suffering does. Nothing does. We are like a tube of toothpaste. What you, when you squeeze it, What's inside is coming out, right? When you, what's inside is coming out. And so it reveals our faith or it reveals our lack of faith, right? And so when life is Gucci, when it's all good, it is easy for me to love people well, to do the right things. It's easy. But when life is hard and I'm suffering, it, it is not easy. It is not easy. So it reveals character. What it also does is it brings about Christ-likeness maturity. When we choose to trust Jesus in the midst of suffering, somehow we become more like him. I don't know how we're to have to do. We become more like him. So as we share in his sufferings, we acquire his character. We acquire his character more over ours, and so we end up responding to things the way that Jesus would respond, and not the way I would normally respond. Right? There is this theological word called sanctification and I love slash hate this word but sanctification means to be set apart or it's the process of becoming and looking more like Christ and so you think about that verse we read earlier Romans 8 28 um, for we know that in all things God will work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose but then you look at your life and your circumstances and you think no no there is no way this is good like, there is no way you can spin this, God, and make this good. Like, how can you sit here and say, you'll work all things out for good, right? I know you guys have had moments like this. this. There's no way this is good, God. But what we have to examine then is, well, okay, well, what is good to God? What is good to God? So then you have to keep reading. So Romans, 20, Romans 8, 28. The very next verse, Romans 8, 29. Here's what it says. And for those who he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Y'all, it is good to God that you would be conformed to the image of his son. It is good to God that you would come out looking more like Jesus. That is what's good to God. And this is hard, right? Because, because suffering helps to sanctify us, that we would look more like Christ. 
And I think a lot of times we have room. We have room for a superior authority, like resurrected, raised up Jesus. But we don't want to make room for a suffering one. We don't want to make room for a suffering one. And we can't get around being a Christian, right? We can't get around being Christians and followers of Jesus, people of the cross, right, without identifying with the suffering too. It's a part of it. So here, suffering, it can strengthen our faith for the next challenge. So sometimes I like to mess around and say, um, I stay ready so I don't have to get ready, right? I'll just say it because I'm like, yes, it's basically saying, I'm always ready. When people are like, are you good? Are you ready? Um, but there is some truth to that. Of like, I've, some, I've heard it said, like, you are either going to a trial, coming out of one. Uh, what is it? Or you're in a trial, going out of one, or coming into one, or whatever. But basically, you're always either going and coming out or in one. Right? This is a never-ending cycle because God is sanctifying us through it. And so we are flexing our faith muscles, right? Not just like what we talked about this morning with Brendan talked about, not just your physical muscles, but your faith muscles are being worked out as you are persevering through suffering. And not only do we grow personally, but God is put on display. So in your notes, God's greatness is reflected. So the way that you persevere in your trials God gets put on display and his strength and power get revealed through how you persevere. So not that you do this perfectly, right? Because when you persevere moment by moment, the moments are ugly, y'all. The crying, the yelling, right? The, uh, you feel, sometimes you feel depressed or you're like, what is going on? Like the moments can be ugly, but you can put God on display. You can put God put on display. So it's noteworthy to know, too, as we're transitioning to the last bit, God doesn't orchestrate your suffering. He does not orchestrate it, but he does allow it. He does allow it, and he wins with any hand. God will win with any hand. So lastly, God uses the suffering and the details of our individual lives to bring about his ultimate aims in history. So I said it on Sunday night, but how we like to think really individually, we think about the individual story, but our stories are a part of God's bigger story, the true story of the whole world. And so God is moving history, all of history, towards one conclusion. And that conclusion is that Satan and all of God's enemies are defeated and finally destroyed, and God is supreme. That is what all of history is moving towards this coming future, the new Jerusalem, when things will be as it's supposed to be, as God meant it to be in the beginning. And then lastly, God transforms the sin and the suffering ooh, of our individual lives into something beautiful in his perfect timing. And if you think back to the, the last part of the story of Joseph in Genesis 50, uh, verse 20, right? So Joseph is now elevated. He's over grain. His brothers need food, so they come to get grain from him, and they don't even recognize him. And he's like, brothers, it's me, it's your boy, Joseph. And they're terrified because they think like, he could kill us, right? And what does Joseph say to him? What does Joseph say to them? Y'all remember? What God, what you meant for harm, God meant for good. What you meant for harm, God meant it for good. And so God will take other people's choices and the suffering you're in, and he will rework them for his purpose in his timing. If it was Joseph's timing, he, 13 years would have been way too much. He would have been like, nah, I'm not doing this for 13 years. But it's God's timing, and God's timing is perfect. So God uses the greatest suffering of all, the cross. Greatest suffering of all to bring about the greatest good for all of humanity, the redemption of all things. And y'all, that's what's coming. I cling to that hope constantly in the midst of my suffering. I cling to it because I'm like, this is not forever. Woo! Hallelujah! Like, I do not have to do this forever. Life will not be this forever because I serve a good God who has, there is hope in him and restoration is coming, right? Restoration is coming. But for now, right, in the midst of this, Lord, how do I be faithful to you in it? How do I be faithful to you 
in the midst of such suffering, God, show me how to do that. So God, he held nothing back, nothing back, not even the death of his own son, that we would be in relationship with him, right? So why would we think that he would hold back anything more so that we could be made more like him? Why would we think he would hold back on us, right? He loves us too much to let us remain as we are. And suffering changes us, that we would become more like him. So I'm going to close with um, a story. Uh, there's a Devo, a devotional book. It's like my favorite. It's called Streams in the Desert. But the writer, um, he tells this story of a dude who had a, he had a moth. Well, he didn't have a moth yet, but he had these. Well, he had a cocoon. And these are emperor moths. And this is so ironic that this picture doesn't even show. I hate bugs. Like in real life, if I saw that, I'd be like, ah! And I'd probably swat it and kill it. Okay, but here's the deal. So that's the emperor moth. So what they're known for, what what emperor moths are known for is their big, beautiful, colorful wings. Like you ain't seen no moths that pretty, okay? I haven't. Um, so this guy had, and this is what their cocoon looks like. So they have that little tiny hole at the, the edge of their cocoon that this moth, this these and these moths are not small. They're pretty big, like, and so that moth has to come out of that little hole in the cocoon. So it tells the story of this guy who had a cocoon like that for over a year. And he's like a bug dude, so he's like waiting for the moth to start to come out of the cocoon so he can see it come out and see the big, beautiful wings, right? So finally, after having this for a year, it, start, it starts to move. And so this moth is like moving around in this cocoon and he sees the struggle and it's moving and he's like, yes! So he's waiting. So he's waiting. Still struggling, just moving, nothing's happening. What the heck? He's waiting. So he's finally like, after some time has passed, he's like, uh, okay, you know, I could just help this dude out because he really wants to see the mop. So he takes his scissors, he takes the very edge of his scissors, and he makes a tiny, tiny little incision on that little hole in the cocoon. And then easily, right after he did that, the moth comes out of the cocoon. <laughs> And he's like waiting for the big, beautiful reveal of these wings that these moths are known for. And it comes out, and it's this huge, swollen body with shriveled wings. And he realizes, like, oh, I have crippled, I have crippled this moth, right? Because what he didn't realize was that it is the friction and the pressure of the moth making its way out of that tiny hole that actually sends blood that makes the wings that look so beautiful. So he has now relieved this moth of the struggle of coming out of that hole, and in doing so, of relieving him from that, the moth will live this subpar life that's not as long, and he'll never fly the way that God created him to do it. He will be this swollen body with shriveled up wings, and he will die pretty instantly because your boy can't fly. Okay, and so this guy, right, we want God to do the same thing to us. When we're suffering, whatever that is, we are like, God, come on. Like, come down and fix this situation. Take me out of this. Like, give me some relief or some reprieve from this crap, right? We want God to do the same thing. Take some little scissors and snip it and make it better. But we don't realize that when God does that, He'll cripple us too. He'll cripple us too. So here's what the writer says about that cocoon and about God. He says, The far-sighted, perfect love that seeks the perfection of its object does not weakly shrink from present transient suffering. Our Father's love is too true to be weak. Because He loves His children, He allows suffering that they may be partakers of his holiness with this glorious end in view he spares not for their crime made perfect through sufferings the sons and daughters of god are trained up to obedience brought to glory through much tribulation this is what you do this is why we suffer because one day god's coming back and he's taking us back with him but until then he's like y'all have to be my people and y'all gotta look like me 
So press in to God. Press in to God in our trials and in our suffering. You guys have a live it page with you. And I'm going to give you a few minutes. I want you to look at that page. 